Uh, and I'm Taylor Lobb, as you can see uh, by my picture. I have the same title. Uh, we work on the same team uh, doing similar work. Uh, where she's responsible for the SPLC. I'm responsible for uh, testing and um, uh, efforts to support the SPLC. Awesome. Throughout the talk, we're going to be represented by these little cartoon characters. So an intro to Adobe. You may have heard of us. We're a small startup out of the Bay Area. Um, we have 16,000 employees in 37 countries. Uh, so we're not a small startup, we're pretty big. At some point we're a startup. Um, but what I wanted to point out with this slide, which was given to us by our marketing team here, um, probably most of this stuff is not relevant to our talk, but the number of employees is relevant to our talk, and then also just the fact that um, Adobe has software that's installed on, from a survey in 2012, uh, like 99% of personal computers with Adobe Flash, right? So, so we're everywhere, we kind of had to learn. Um, to make sure that security comes first in our product life cycle. And, and so that's what we're focused on in the Experience Cloud. So speaking of the Experience Cloud, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the company is, is split up. Most of the people know Adobe as uh, what we're referred to as the Creative Cloud and the Document Cloud, right? So you have Acrobat as part of the Document Cloud. You have Creative Suite as part of the Creative Cloud. We are actually part of a business unit within Adobe called the Experience Cloud. And unless you're a marketer for um, a business somewhere, you probably haven't heard of what we do. But we do digital marketing for, um, for, for corporations, and we're, we're pretty big in that space. So we represent the, the Experience Cloud, and our experience will be talking about how we've done this in that business unit. As such, we'll, we won't be answering any questions about the other two clouds, like Flash or anything like that. So uh, sorry if that's what you came here to find out about. We, we're not part of that. So. I'll uh, give it back over to Julia, and she can uh, take it away. OK, so the ideology behind our secure product life cycle and, and kind of the program that um, Taylor and I rolled out um, is that technology solves a lot of problems. And, and when you talk and work with technologists, um, like engineers, which is what we're doing, if you don't have technology in place, um, they're not going to listen to you or hear what you're saying. If you've got bad processes and bad technology, they're not going to um, yeah. hang out, right? So um, technology is vitally important. So Taylor's going to talk about that in his case study of static analysis. We're going to talk about kind of some of the automation that we put in place to help support um, a secure product lifecycle and our engineers. Um, but what's also important, and another key tenant of our SPLC is the people. So you can see there's like a guy holding all of this, right? So it's technology and people. Um, so within security, there's a good deal of herding cats maybe, is something you've probably experienced being a security person. Um, so we've had to combine uh, conscious and consistent cultural change. Um, and I'm going to talk about our security champions program and how we rolled out our secure product life cycle to make sure we had buy-in um, at all levels and so we're able to, to get this to be something that was um, um, in integrated into um, our development life cycle. So just a quick caveat on Motivation theory, something I'm really interested in, is psychology and why people do the things they do. And more <laughs> importantly, maybe in security, and maybe you guys can relate to this, is why people don't do some things. Um, and so there's, there's two primary reasons why a person might do a thing. And a person might do a thing because they're directly paid to do that thing. Um, and paid is, uh, can include um, like some form of you just have to do the thing, um, some, some kind of forcing them to do the thing. And then the, the second reason that someone might do a thing is it's something they're excited about, something that they want to do. Um, think about things that people volunteer for, something that um, they're interested in, and they would do it, they do it regardless of being paid for it. Um, they do it because it's something that they find fulfilling. Um, so this is kind of what we are trying to drive at Adobe, the second one, as part of our secure product life cycle, something that um, fits into the process and appeals to kind of our engineers uh, intrinsic motivation to write good quality, high quality code. Um, and so we said, you know, security is part of that. Um, and so we <laughs> uh, appeal to kind of the thing that they want to do. And it's a good way to get um, the engineers on their side. So problem statement here. Also, we spent a lot of time on this slide. So please be impressed with all of our transitions here. So we've got the engineering team. This is, this is who we work with primarily for our secure product life cycle. They're very happy writing code, building suite features, making our customers happy, um, 
all these things, you know, solving difficult engineering problems. Uh, they're having a great time. And then we've got some groups that come to them and say, you've got these requirements, right? Like, you kind of have to change some of the things that you're doing um, to meet these requirements, but they're kind of fuzzy and not that clear. And so the engineers, as you can see by their eyebrows and mouths that I changed, because I'm good at that kind of thing, or, you know, they start to get a little confused. And then you have other groups that come to them and they say, and here's the tools and processes that you have to use, which are outside of the tools and processes that you already use to develop software. Go log in to this tool over here, and you're going to find your security bugs here, or you're going to find the process over here out of the way. Engineers are still a bit confused. And then you have even more groups. So you got like the security team who's coming, and they're saying, oh, and here's the risk associated with those things, and here's our advice on how to fix them, here's the remediation, and maybe here's our tool over here that you can use for that too. So the engineers at this point are somewhere around here, and they're just mad, right? They're like, we don't know what you guys are getting at. 17 different people are telling me 18 different things to do and different systems to log into. And then what do I actually do? Um, and so that's kind of the problem that we were trying to solve with our secure product lifecycle is saying, okay, let's take everything that everybody has to do for security, build it into a secure product lifecycle, make it the same for all of our teams. Um, so, uh, the first thing we did here is get buy-in and, and leverage existing process. So, um, first I went and talked to the developers, and I said, how do you guys develop code? How do you guys push this to production, and you know, where are your code repos, and where um, do you spend all your time? And so I found out, you know, they spent all their time in Jira and GitHub and all of this. Um, <clears throat> then I went to talk to program management and I said, hey guys, how do you prioritize the stuff that you um, have to do, you know, and, and product management, and where do you get your priorities, and, and how can we get them there? And so, so we did discovery there as well, so that helped us um, to kind of understand the organization. Um, and then finally we went to uh, the engineering leadership team, so these are like the VPs um, and, and directors over software engineering and said, we need your buy-in for this. I need you to name a security champion on your team. Someone on your team has to be responsible for security. Um, and you know, how do we how do we help do that and make your our customers happy? Um, so we got all the information about how the software is developed and how we communicate that and um, and what do we care about and those kind of things from the engineering and program management teams. Um, and so at that point we go to our service life cycle. So we call our, I think you've probably heard of SDLC, the Secure Development Life Cycle, and I know we call it SPLC, you guys know it's a little different than Secure Product Life Cycle. Um, and we also have this, this is our service life cycle at Adobe that we use to uh, develop our new software. This is something that our program management team has developed, and you guys see security in there. Ta -da. So it's at the bottom, it's in this line of things that says, maintain market security analytics. Those are not even the same parts of speech. And so what does that mean, right? Like it's, it's kind of, it goes back to our cursing developers. Like we're very confused. What does it mean to security, right? Um, so, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so what I did was I took this and uh, I said, okay, well, let's find out what that means. And then we put security checkpoints at these different points. So this is something um, where we took the SLC and made it our secure product life cycle. Um, and so each of these little shields represents an activity that a program manager or an engineer or engineering leadership has to uh, complete. So for engineers, obviously, it's, it's making sure that they're writing uh, secure code, and that includes doing training um, and making sure that um, they're addressing the bugs that get brought into um, the Jira system that we're we'll bringing to them. Um, and then program managers, it includes making sure that these issues are prioritized, put on people's roadmaps and, and get done. And then for engineering leadership, it, makes, it includes uh, signing off on this stuff, right? Because yeah, that ultimately aligns with them. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to talk about each of these things in detail, um, but, but just know we have different levels of sign off and, and activities there. Um, what I do want to get into is how do we do this? So, as I mentioned, we're a small security team. We had uh, me and Taylor and one other engineer on our team when we started in the digital marketing business unit. We've got thousands of engineers. So, um, so 
how do we scale this tiny team to be responsible for all these people and all of the code that they're writing every single day? Um, and and um, I think in, in digital marketing, most of our uh, products actually came from acquisitions. And so we've got different development styles, we've got different release cadences, we've got all kinds of different things that we're trying to work with and leverage. Um, so the way that we did this and the approach that we took here again, is security champions. So I'm going to talk about that in a second, but also automation. We certainly couldn't have done it without either of those things. Um, and so, kind of the uh, the takeaway here is that I, in in our opinion, it's easier to teach an engineer to think about security than to have a small team of people think about um, the nuances of every single product and understand them so deeply that they can um, you know give give the proper security advice for those things. So we're enabling um, and empowering our security champions to kind of help be the voice of security on the team. Um, so what is a champion? As I mentioned, we went to product leaders and we asked for a security champion on each of our product teams. And so uh, the definition of a product security champion that I gave them, and we were rolling this out, is a security champion is an engineer on your team who cares about security. That's, that's something that's important. And uh, I'll talk about our training in a second and kind of how we talk to those people. Um, um, someone who's familiar with the application, so don't give me your most junior dev who just joined the team in college because um, they're not going to have the understanding of the product that we need for someone um, with security. So in most cases, I got lead developers or um, or architects as my security champions. And so the champions, um, their responsibility is to be point of contact for our security team, as well as to inform our security team um, of what's going on with their team. So we tell them kind of what's coming from a security point of view. We consolidate all of that uh, confusing stuff that they're getting from all the different groups. And we say, okay, here's... Here's your roadmap. Here's what you need to do for security. Here's the things that are required. Here's the things that are nice to have. And here's your dates for getting them done. Um, so we consolidate all of that and hand it to a single person, single point of contact, the security team, or security champion, but we also communicate it, obviously, up to leadership. We have a set of IND program management who helps do the prioritization of this. Um, so that security champion um, meets with me, actually, meet with all of our champions every other week uh, to make sure that. I'm kept in the loop on what's going on on their teams, and they're kept in the loop as far as um, if anything is shifted on the security side. Um, our champions have been have been awesome. So at first we established one champion per team. So in digital marketing, uh, we have eight solutions. Um, but because I mentioned we are made up of a bunch of acquisitions, it's actually a lot more teams uh, internally. And so um, we had about 15 champions, and so now we've got. Uh, somewhere near 35 or something like that, um, that has kind of grown a lot. So what was something that was interesting, um, when we first started rolling out champions, most teams were actually pretty excited about this, and I think that's because we appealed to their motivation to write good quality software. So we said, you know, um, customers are asking about this, it's coming up with all the deals and all the things that we're selling, everybody's checking our security, and to um, write good quality software that's going to delight our customers. We need to include security in that thing and we need to make it so it's not a question. So that's something that's table stakes um, for all of our securities, or sorry, for all of our solutions. Um, and so we've expanded the number of security champions. It's gotten much bigger. Um, and also our champions have kind of, some of them have like really grabbed onto that role and made it something that's more of their full-time gig. Um, so when I first asked for security champions, it was something that we asked the um, Projects, make sure um, we're updated on things, help do with health draft status and stuff like that. Um, some of my champions have gone and asked their management to make this their full-time gig, so it's in their title um, and, it's, and it's something that they do uh, kind of day in and day out. I had one champion who, after each of our uh, security champion meetings, and I didn't know he was doing this, but it was like a fun surprise. He started sending out security newsletters to his team. Um, so he would find something interesting in the news about security or um, pick a favorite of the top 10 um, vulnerability and kind of write it out and say, you know, this is what this is and here's why it's important specifically to our application if you're trying to avoid it. Um, and then he would, you know, follow it up with status. And so that was kind of something where he took the role and he, like, turned it up a little bit. Um, I also had one champion who took the role and he made a group of sub-champions. And he's one of the ones who turned it into his full-time gig. He, he does, I think, 80% security work at this point, um, and he's 
got a security um, reference on each of the scrum teams. And so that's something where he's kind of outsourced a little bit of that to his team um, and said, okay, you're responsible for making sure that in you know, all of your scrum meetings, security is getting properly prioritized. And so he's got eyes um, on each of like the sub teams on his team. So um, security champion programs has really been something that's grown a lot. And um, it's something that at first, um, I kind of hesitated to give them a ton of work because like, right now security's overhead. It's, it's really hard, you know, this bad attitude towards the security or whatever. Um, but it, it really is something that people have kind of um, grasped onto and made part of their role and, and one of their core competencies. Uh, so training. So I mentioned I was going to talk about this. At Adobe, we require all of our engineers to do uh, two levels of technical training. There's like, we've got a, a bunch of like white papers and talks about the kind of training system, so I won't get too deep into it. But what we're going to develop our computer-based training, and that's technical training based on the Wasp Top 10 uh, and common vulnerabilities and how to avoid them in, in code. And so there's, there's training for engineers, software developers, and management in those two um, sections, and that's required for, as I mentioned, every engineer. And then there's also brown and black belt um, certifications, and that um, is through experiential and hands-on training. So that's something where um, if somebody is doing a security project, they can submit that. It's actually like a form that you submit and say, um, I've done um, this project and it's had this impact and I've you know, helped security for this. And then you get points, and then with those points, you can be awarded a brown or black belt. And so a lot of our security champions are actually going for this and they're um, submitting a lot of the projects that they're working on to get kind of this um, elite level certification. There's not that many brown or black belts. It, it does require a lot of work to get there. And so it's And then also, we do training specifically for the security champions. So down here we've got, I put our logo for Champ Summit 2016. Um, so this is something where we get all of the champions in one location. So as I mentioned, they're all over the world. Um, we have them in different countries. So um, we get everybody in one location. It's a mountain because it was in our Lehigh office most recently. Um, and, we, and we get them together for kind of two days of hands-on training and some deep diving on on how to um, uh, do security things, our processes, uh, things that they can go back and educate their team on, but also uh, things like certifying them to public journals and things like that so that they can um, have that experience. Um, this is our marketing version of the SPLC. This is something that we publish in our white papers. Um, and so we've established KPIs around each of these um, kind of Boxes that have been pointed out on the side here, so as I mentioned, training required 100% white and green belt, requirements, planning, and design. They have to have some level of engagement from the uh, security champion and, and security researchers and architects. And then in development and testing, we've got uh, the static analysis that Taylor's going to talk about, as well as manual pen testing, um, staging and stabilization, and deployment have checkpoints for security as well. And then we also have uh, monitoring, um, application monitoring, as well as. OS and system, system logging and monitoring. Um, and, and in any case of abuse, fraud, or incident response, we've got KPIs around how quickly you have to respond to those things. Um, so, so it's important to establish the KPIs and make sure that they're something that's measurable and something that the teams can um, work with. All right, so um, secure product lifecycle checkpoints. So I just wanted to kind of recap here. So we do training. Um, Establish a champion on your team, uh, make sure that there's security testing, make sure that the compliance requirements are captured within the processes that you're giving to the champions, and it's something that's um, the same across teams. This is something that has been really helpful because we've been able to leverage uh, security champions in our secure product lifecycle to attest to compliance for all of the Whereas, um, I think, and, and then auditors can go in and pick a solution and, and know that they're all running off of the same system here. It's not a different system. We also do threat modeling, and that's um, something that's like our security architects, but also um, security champions as well. Um, and then ensure that measurement and KPIs are something that um, can be published far and wide and, and be standard. Um, automation, which Taylor's going to get into in a second. Um, and then do recognition of your security champions. And um, I don't have a deep dive on that, but that's something that we really have noticed. It's something that, that drives the security champions um, to, to do good work. They're recognized as the security um, 
expert on their team. It's something where the teams have kind of looked to um, check with the security champion for doing certain things, or, or they're kind of the person who, they, who the engineering teams know has, has the information about what's going on with security. Um, they get pulled into customer conversations and this kind of thing. And then finally, um, add value. So make sure that you're um, a security team that is adding value instead of adding process and overhead to the teams. So we try to abstract away as much of the overhead as we can and give the teams exactly what they need to be able to do the work. Um, and so with that, adding value, I'm going to have Taylor come talk about the automation that we've set up for static analysis. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? It's working? OK. I'm probably going to spend most of the time messing with the microphone, so that's what you get. Um, so yeah. So Julia mentioned that automation is a checkpoint for the SPLC. Um, and in order to effectively manage the SPLC, it became clear that at a very early stage that we ne needed to automate almost every, every process because we were such a small team trying to scale to thousands of, of engineers. Um, specifically, what we were looking to do was like reporting and monitoring, because as we're all probably familiar, if you're not monitoring or reporting on the things you're doing, you might as well not be doing it. People aren't going to listen to you unless you have metrics around it. Uh, compliance is going to basically say you're not doing it. Uh, those different types of things. So um, you you have to have those those monitoring and reporting things, and it's just too much of a task to do manually if you're the only one responsible for it, or if, even if you have a small team, it's just not something that is scalable. Right? It'll take all of your time to manually report on all these things. Um, additionally, uh, product team leaders need to see this information. They're not going to know what to action on if, they, if, you, if you don't tell them, right? If you just say, we're doing security stuff or we're not doing security stuff here, they're, they're going to ask you where and why and how and how do I make things better. Having the effect of reporting and monitoring is going um, to encourage that and, and actually get them to, to, to see the value that they're adding there. So here's Cartoon Taylor again. Um, uh, just to reintroduce myself, I am, I'm responsible for um, security testing for the product teams within digital marketing. Uh, includes uh, our internal manual penetration testing as well as our automated testing. I want to go back to uh, a case study and talk about an experience I had when I was just my humble beginnings as a security analyst trying to solve all of the world's problems. Um, so I came in and decided that I wanted to come up with a solution for um, static analysis. Um, so want to talk kind of like the world before automation, right? Or how the situation was when I came in to take a look at things. Um, there was a tool. We, we offered, there was a tool offered to teams that, that they could use. They could have access to it. Um, but the responsibility was on the teams to perform their own scannings, uh, right? Or scans. We would just say, here's a tool. Uh, go nuts. Please scan your code. Um, you know, best of luck, that kind of thing. Uh, as a, and it was kind of an opt-in thing. So as a result, there was very little utilization. Um, so, you know, I sought to, to kind of solve this problem, see how I can help, uh, you know, partner with the teams as opposed to just giving them access to a tool and, then, and helping them utilize it, right? So, um, I came up with the idea for kind of a static analysis as a service, which is, which is what is extended to most of the activities within the SPLC is, is we, we have a requirement, but then we have a service offering to help them satisfy that requirement, right? So we don't just say, you need to do all of these things. It's, you, sh you need to do all these things, but here's how you can do it. Here's how we can help you do it. Here's how we can do it for you, right? And so it started with the static analysis as a service. And what I wanted to do is, is create a service that required little to no effort from the engineering teams to, to take advantage of it, right? There was no overhead or little overhead. Maybe they just needed to do a thing to get onboarded. But going from there, they, they really wouldn't have to do anything right, outside of their normal activities. I also wanted it to be centralized so we could do that reporting and that monitoring that we talked about. So compliance is happy, product leadership is happy. I wanted to create this service that you know, satisfied the requirements for everybody, but also didn't require a ton of overhead. So I first went out to discover what, what I was dealing with, right? And as we've mentioned, digital marketing is comprised of a lot of acquisitions. So we have several solutions within digital marketing that represent companies that we've acquired. As such, we acquire the, their processes and procedures for developing software. Their languages and technologies are all different, right? So different solutions within digital marketing could be different, right? It varies. So it's not just, we all, we all use Java, right? So I can solve a problem for Java and we're good to go, right? It's, we have a, a, a vast amount of languages and technologies and Trying to centralize that with one process, one tool, uh, how is I going to do that? 
So um, additionally, I wanted to understand those workflows, right? Like how do our engineers, how do they develop code? How can I create a process that isn't going to be very disruptive or at the least disruptive, right? Um, to come in and say, uh, you're doing great work, but I need you to spend 20% of your time doing this other thing that's completely outside of what you're, what you're doing, what you want to be doing, that, that's kind of a harder pill to swallow. So creating a process that, in, that was part of their existing workflows is really, really going to be really important as well. So another thing too was, um, you know, it's great. We, to, I've, I've had experience of creating these, these really cool processes and these really cool tools and having this UI you log into and it gives you all the stuff you want. But maybe not a lot of people want to take their time to go log into a different system to check status on things, right? They, they, they just don't want to, right? They, they have all these other tools and all these other things they're already working in for security to come in and say, oh, and by the way, for your security needs, go to our security portal. It's like, why, why do I need to do that? I'm, I'm working in JIRA or I'm working here, right? Like, I don't want another login. I don't want to have to work in another thing. That's a waste of my time or it's just inefficient at best, right? So after I discovered and collected all my data, um, I, I decided that I needed to create this platform, this automation platform to support this and other activities going forward. Um, I saw the problem as being kind of big, so I wanted it to be scalable, and it became apparent as a team of one trying to solve this problem for all digital marketing. I wasn't going to be able to do it all by myself manually. Hundreds of millions of lines of code to scan, wasn't going to be able to do that on my own. So created this automation platform um, to be scalable. I wanted it to, although I created it in the context of static analysis or code scanning, I wanted it to be agnostic of the input, right? So any input um, you could take and it could push out to whatever workflow you wanted, right? And I'll get into the specifics of what I mean a little bit uh, on the next slide, but um, if it was a particular code scanner or if we had multiple code scanners or if you had a dynamic application scanner or results from a manual pen test, wherever you got these results from, I wanted this platform to be able to consume that so we could push that out where it needed to go. So, you know, if you had a code scanner and, a, and an application scanner and manual pen test, right, or whatever you have these, your, you know, your results from, you know, you have to either send out reports to engineering teams or they have to log into different portals or, or, or mess with different tools to be able to see the results. I wanted a, a, a way to make it so that it was all in one place that they could see and they, they didn't have to, to be trained on all this stuff just to figure out what they had to do. So this was the result. This is the automation workflow that I came up with for static analysis, right? So we have our engineering teams. They write code, right? And as all engineering teams do, they check their code into some sort of source repository. Uh, Git, for instance. Automation platform then checks out that code. And it can be done on whatever interval you want, right? If we want to do it on commit, we can, we can run the scan. If we want to do it on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or whatever interval you want. That's what we, we designed it to do, right? So we'll run these scans at, at whatever interval. Then we'll, you know, this is the, S, the, the static analysis workflow, but like I said, the, the, the scanning or the input is agnostic, so you can replace that with whatever you want. In this case, it's a static analysis scanner. We'll scan that code um, using all the APIs, obviously. Then our, our automation platform will, will pull down those results and parse and process those results. And we'll do a couple of things with those. We'll, do, we'll actually do quite a few things with those. However, um, I'm gonna highlight a few. First and foremost, we send an email summary of what happened to whoever's been identified as, as interested parties, right? And a lot of times it's the product leadership, they just wanna see that it happened and maybe see an overview of anything was found, maybe not specifics. Send it to the people who might be actioning on it, those different kinds of things. Additionally, we take those issues and inject them right into the bug tracking system, right? So right into JIRA in this case. So our engineering teams don't have to go log into the static analysis scanner. They don't have to log into the dynamic analysis scanner to see their results. All they do is, is write their code, check it in, and then they'll see a JIRA issue if there's anything they have to do. Right? Not, nothing outside of their workflow. As it gets put in, they can, they can put it into their sprint. They can plan for it. They don't have to do anything. They don't even have to know the scan happened. And in most cases, they, the, the, the engineers don't. The security champions do because they're aware of the process, right? But as far as the engineers go, they're just checking in code, and our process will scan all of the code that gets checked in. So they don't even care. Another benefit of doing this is we're able to take the results and kind of, uh, it's not deduplication per se, it's kind of grouping. So if anybody's familiar with the way like some code scanners work is they'll give you an individual result for everything that is found. So if they find a particular uh, issue in, in a file and there's 50 instances of it, that's 50 individual issues found in a report, right? Well, we kind of take that and, and use base a little and apply a little bit of logic to it and report that as one issue. 
So if 50 of the same issues are found in one file, that's reported as one issue, because then the engineer can get one issue assigned to them, they see, oh, there's 50 instances in this file, I just need to fix it here and close it, as opposed to having to close 50 different issues or log into a system to do it. So there is a lot of efficiencies to be gained by, by parsing the results on your own as well. So that was, that was the solution for SPLC, or for, for static analysis. And, it's, and, and, it, and the, I'll talk about the rollout. Um, kind of a, a spoiler alert, it's been wildly successful, right? Having it so that teams don't have to do anything really uh, means the adoption is really high. In fact, it's 100%. So um, when, when we do all the heavy lifting for them, we go to them and say, S or static analysis is a requirement. You have to have your code scan at this interval as part of the SPLC. And oh, by the way, we're taking care of all that for you. Just, we're just letting you know, just in case you start to see these things come in, because these shear issues are gonna come in or you'll get these email reports. This is what it's from. So no worries, we've handled it all for you. Um, you know, have fun, right? Um, so anyway, how do we roll this out going from the world as we knew it before to, to now? Uh, we made it a requirement. But instead of just saying, this is required of you now, figure out a way to do it, it says, this is required of you now, we've solved the problem for you, right? So uh, that's kind of a key success to rolling out. Additionally, we partnered with the security champions. They, they are very familiar with the process. They know what's going on. They know how to communicate it to their teams. So nothing's a surprise if they start to get things in there, uh, you know, things that they need to action on. Um, additionally, if you're going to do this, uh, some, some key things that I would, I would kind of take into mind, if, if, you, uh, if you were doing this with a larger organization, maybe partner with one team or pilot with a team, get your process ironed out and make sure, you know, um, that you can get that all worked out before you push that out to everybody else. And when you push that out to everybody else, don't just do a pilot with one team and then kind of open the, the floodgates for everybody else to be on it. Phase in the approach, right? If you have multiple teams and a dozen teams, maybe do a couple at a time. That way you can make sure if there's any customizations or issues with your system, make sure that your system can handle the load. Uh, you know, phase in an approach, I think, is, is gonna be more successful. Um, so kind of in summary, um, you know, we, we, we talked about the SPLC and how it's intended to be a system to support the engineers in developing their, their software securely. Um, and in our case, by removing much of the security overhead from the teams themselves, uh, it's created a culture of partnership. So we can you know, deliver software that we can be proud of. We can work directly with the teams. So as opposed to the teams kind of fighting and, and like writing their, the, their software and us coming in and telling them things they have to do. It's like, we're, we're a team, we're, we're all in this together. Um, so additionally, I mean, Julia mentioned uh, uh, the CHAMP Summit uh, and other uh, culture-related activities. Having the CHAMPs in place, having the, the, the mature SPLC has enabled us to do some really cool things in terms of culture, kind of freed up our time, even though we are a smaller team, to be able to put things on like the CHAMP Summit or we've done things called Hacker Village, which is what, like, a way that we can test, uh, train people on pen testing methods and things like that. So we've been able to do some really cool things that give security a good name and builds a really good culture around security. Um, this is all enabled by our SPLC.